Thank you. Great being here, really. It's my first time in talking at Vox, so I'm also quite excited to do that. And today, I need my slides, but okay, I want to talk to you about automated testing, which we probably have heard about. So, um, who of you have done some automated testing in your projects? Oh, not bad, not bad. So, who thinks that it's enough automated testing? Nice, that's what I wanted to see. That is also, my opinion, it's never enough. So, uh, today I want to talk to you about how we, in our project, evolved automated testing. I'm Apostolos Jokas, I'm a software engineer at Uxma, and I'm a member of the Home Connect Apps core team. Some words about our application here, the Home Connect app. Um, we at Oxma are from the very first day developing together with our client, the BSH, the Home Connect app. With the Home Connect app, you can control your household appliances from Bosch, Siemens, and their partners. From the washing machine to the coffee maker, from the dishwasher to um, what else? The dryer. Uh, the, this app gives you total control, and you can access and control your appliances anytime from anywhere. I am personally I am a part of the Home Connect app's core team, and my main focus lies in iOS. So the Home Connect allows the user to connect to his household appliances, either through a local Wi-Fi connection or through a cloud connection. We started developing this app around about 10 years ago, and from the very beginning, we wanted to assure a high quality and also to be able to have a short release cycle. In order to achieve all this, we needed to have extensive automated testing, which would continuously check our app and be our guarantee that everything is working as expected. Probably most of you have seen this here. This is the so-called testing pyramid. There are multiple variations of it, but we will focus on this one, which has four different layers. You can see here at the bottom, we have a broad layer, which are unit tests. Unit tests test just one function or one class. Um, like you see, they are the foundation of our pyramid. Why? Because they run very fast and they are quite cheap to write and to maintain. Uh, the next layer are our integration tests. This test now tests multiple either classes or scenarios or modules in parallel. Not in parallel, uh, test multiple uh, units in parallel. Um, they are slower because I need to test more things and harder to maintain and therefore they are more expensive here. The above layer are the end-to-end -end tests. These tests now are the only tests which test from the perspective of the end user. They are much harder to write, they run much slower and are much harder to maintain, therefore. But therefore, we have less of that. At the top of our pyramid are the manual testing. There really, a dedicated tester would need to test different scenarios of our application. And therefore, it cannot be done in, inside our CI-CD cycle, and they are very expensive to do. This was also our initial strategy. Let's have, we said, a lot of unit tests and cover all scenarios or different scenarios, and we did that. So we had unit tests for our database implementation, for the home appliance communication, for the home appliance business logic. But then we had the idea to have, instead of having tests for every simple single unit, let's have end-to-end -end UI tests. Tests would, would check our application, test our application from the perspective of the user. So we will check the UI, we will test the business logic, and we will test the communication all within. At that moment in time, that was really nine, ten years ago, the end-to-end -end tests run quite fast. So we were quite happy with them. But they did run fast just for the simple fact that our app wasn't so big yet. We also did write a piece of software, which we called the Home Appliance Simulator. 
which would perfectly simulate one or multiple household appliances. We use that in our UI tests to simulate a home appliance and to test different scenarios like pair of home appliance, um, connect to it, then select a program, program, start a program, check if everything is working as expected, and then lock the user out again. This is a video, I fished it out from our archive, it's from 2013, where we did all that. So with every additional feature, we did write at least one new UI test. An issue was that for every test, we needed to start our application, we needed to lock the user in, pair an appliance, test our scenario then, and then remove the appliance and lock the user out, which of course did take some time. The, the, the testing time then with every new feature grew, and we are forced to let the UI tests run out of our CICD process. They were running continuously, also overnight, and when they failed, some developer needed to take care of that and check what was happening wrong and needed to fix that. So more comment, more tests, more tests, longer test time. Soon a full testing cycle needed over 100 minutes. And also flaky tests started to appear. So if you don't know, flaky test, test is considered a test which is uh, sometimes green, sometimes red. And due to some magic reason, which is quite bad. So, what did we learn from that time, back then? We learned that test, tests need to be fast, really fast. And tests need to be a part of your CICD process. It has no benefit for you, or very, a very small benefit, if they are running outside of your CICD process. The tests should be deterministic. They should always have this exact same result. And if you have flaky tests, test, uh, take care of them immediately. Also, the, the, your tests should be completely independent from each other. So one test should never influence another test. And they, of course, should be stable and repeatable. So we need to change our testing strategy. And what we did is we descoped UI tests completely. After a while, we also removed the whole code there. And we focused on unit and integration tests. This test now did run much faster than our UI tests. They were much more stable. We had less, much less flaky tests. And the most, con most important part was we had our confidence back that our test strategy was good. And for quite a long time, this worked quite well. And our app became more successful and popular. And our team also got bigger. And instead of having six, seven, eight developers, we soon had around 10 different app development teams, actually. And all the teams were now fully occupied implementing the features which our customers needed. With and with every new feature, of course, our code base grew. And from 250,000 lines of code, we soon reached 800,000 lines. And with the new features, the complexity of the code base grew too. Tests did not get any simpler. And we got much more tests, and the testing time did also multiplied from a built-in test time for around about 20 minutes, we soon got it to 45 minutes. So also our first principle, the tests need to run fast. We didn't, we were not conformed to that anymore. And guess what? Flaky tests appeared again. And after some times, our tests were so flaky, the flaky tests were so dominant that we did lose our confidence in our tests completely. When we had a failed test, we were not sure if our code changes uh, caused the issue or some other random thing. And then, then we got really, really creative. What we did is, yeah, my build is green, let's 
rerun this build and maybe next time it will be green and they can match my ticket and I can continue with my feature and my product owner will be happy. And this became common practice actually back then to just rerun it till it was green. And this was not the best, the worst thing. If a test was too complicated to fix or very flaky, yeah, maybe we just remove the test. Of course, no test, no failing test. No problem there. And actually, this is much worse that we had also committed out code. So we committed out a test till some magic day somebody would take care of that. And this day never came, of course. So for a second time, we needed to change something. And we needed to change it to the bing a bit more. So we needed to change our structure. We needed to change on how we write new code. And we needed to change our old code. What we did is we created a team which would not implement features, nor be a dedicated bug fixing team. A team which would enable other teams to work better and more efficient in their features. And we named it the core team. So what does our core team do? The core team has the ownership of the CI-CD process. And it does do some um, critical security fixes. It's tasked to define the overall architecture of the application. It does support other teams when needed. And it's monitoring performance. So it's monitoring the performance as well as of the app as of the CI CD process. It handles some deprecations, it handles technical debt. It actually, we, we write some code. So we write tooling. We write tooling for the other teams. We do the release management. And we do some overarching features like dependency management or navigation. But due to our situation back then, our situation was we were extremely unstable. Some topics needed our immediate focus. And we needed to define an architecture which would be, would be more um, suitable for bigger code bases and would enable our teams to write better automated tests. And we needed to tackle the technical depth. I said it again, why we needed these two points at first? Because we were not able to release. We were read the whole time. So the architecture change we decided to do was to switch from MVVM to clean, clean architecture. We had some very good experience with clean architecture in a different smaller projects. And we saw that clean architecture helps your project to be easy maintainable and easy testable. And it would help us to increase our automated testing possibilities. How did we use how do we use clean architecture? We set up a layered architecture which consists out of five layers. The user interface layer, the view model layer, our use case layer, repositories and sources. One very strict rule is that no layer does know anything about the layers which are above it. So a use case should never know about any view model or any UI screen. Never. It only, they only know the interface of the layer which are exactly below them. So, and the use cases will only know the interfaces of our repositories and nothing more. So what's the purpose of each layer then? Um, our source layer, which is at the bottom, it communicates and wraps external and internal data sources. In the source layer, we have things like our database. We have our REST services. We have WebSocket connections. We have Bluetooth connections. We have device storage. And we also there wrap third-party libraries. Very important here, our source layer does not contain any business logic. We have the repository layer above. And its only job is it needs to know which source to uh, access in order to retrieve or send information. 
Nothing more. Again here, it should not contain any business logic. Our use cases. That's the interesting layer, actually. Here we have the business logic of our application. The use cases have, have our business logic, but they do not know anything about any UI screen. They do not know about screens. They do not know about fonts, about colors, nothing. They contain the business logic in an abstract way. So it can be reused in different screens and in different, by, by different view models. Some examples here. We have uh, use cases like start program use case, or is appliance connected use case, or what I have written here, is appliance part on use case. So quite simple use cases, which can be reused all over the application. We have our view model layer, which retrieves data from our use cases and exposes them to the UI layer, through, usually through data binding. It, it then intercepts user input from above, processes it, and passes it to you over to use cases. Here, we manage state. So the view models are responsible for maintaining the state of a particular screen. And they do not contain business logic, again. At the top, we have our screens, finally. Screens, UI elements, again, not a single line of code of business logic, very important. And usually our, all our, our screens have one view model from where they get the, the necessary information. Like every architecture, also clean architecture, has uh, some pros and some cons. It has a steep learning curve, especially for developers who are not familiar for, with the principles of software engineering. This may require some additional training and education in the beginning in order to implement it effectively. It has some increased complexity when setting it up. So if you need to set it up in an existing Go code base, it, it is quite challenging to separate all those layers correctly. It has some increased development time because of this abstraction layers and all these different layers, actually. So it can be more time consuming than writing everything in one single file. So it might not be the best architecture for small projects or projects with a very limited budget. Um, and of course, these layers, because we need to abstract, we have, need to have abstractions between each layers, they do add additional overhead. On the other side, clean architecture is really excellent testable. It makes our code base modular and it's, it reduces our dependencies. And therefore, we can write much better unit integration and UI tests. It has a very good separation of concerns. Um, the, all these different components are separate in the different layers, which makes them much easier to maintain. And we are able to manage the complexity of a bigger system. And this also reduces the risk for introducing new bugs every time we change our code, either to do another bug fix or to add an additional feature, which is actually the third point, maintainability here. It helps the code to be maintainable because you need to keep the code clean and organized. And therefore, it's much easier to add new features and a, co and a code base which is written by clean architecture. And from the foundation, it's written to be scalable. All this layering and abstracting the functionalities, it makes it much more easier to add new features to your code without without requiring significant changes to the existing code base. But that wasn't the only thing we wanted to do. We wanted actually to split our 800,000 lines code monolith, because it was one single monolith, to smaller and easy maintainable modules. 
one way we could modularize it was to have uh, each layer be in a separate module. But our application was already 800,000 lines of code. So our modules will be already very, very big. So obviously, that, that wouldn't be a good solution for us. We decided to use a feature-based modularization and not the layer-based one. Our, call, our goal was, and still is, to have our modules as small as possible. From the very beginning, we, needed to know, to, uh, we, we knew that we needed to have a solid architecture and solid rules in order not to descend into chaos here. We knew that if we did not set up any rules here, soon every module would depend on every other module. And would, we, would have, we would have a small dependency hell. So why is that bad? Because it makes our system much harder to test and to maintain. And that also increases our build times. That's why we decided to split our modules in three different groups. We have our feature modules, which, like the name says, it, they contain our features. We have our core modules, which contain our business logic. And we have our shared modules, which contain various utilities. Also here, we have some dependency rules. Feature modules are not allowed to know each other. The core modules, or the other, uh, but they can know, they can uh, use core modules and shared modules. The core modules have no idea about feature modules. They have our business logic, remember. And they are also not allowed to talk to each other. So one core module should not know, not know anything about another core module. But they, of course, can, they can use our shared modules there. In the shared modules, we are a bit more flexible there. They can, of course, not know core and feature modules, but they are allowed to know each other. So, we split our app, actually, and we created the modules, a lot of them. And parts of the application, which had a good test coverage, could be migrated to independent modules easy, and we had a high confidence that we did not introduce bugs while doing so. Unit tests, which we wrote 10 years ago, saved us a lot, a lot of trouble by assuring us that we didn't do anything wrong while migrating. We migrated the whole database implementation, logic, entities, which was quite a amount of code, in a matter of days. The existing unit tests showed us by failing the problems we were introducing, and we could fix them immediately. But and I think we need to tackle our technical depth and we need to refactor our old code in order to fix the instability we had. But how to decide what needs to be refactored first? Parts of the code which had more errors were chosen to be refactored first in order to stabilize our tests. Following by parts of the application which were changed often in order to have these parts written in clean architecture, which code then could be reused much more easily in new features than code written in, in MVVM. Modularization and clean architecture boosted our ability to have good and stable tests. The scope of each module was limited, and therefore it was very easy to write good tests for, the, for it. And because of its size, the build and test time was also fast. We, we were able to build and test multiple modules in parallel. And our overall build time dropped from 45 minutes to under 20. And flaky tests were also drastically reduced. Modularization and clean architecture changed the way we tested our app. The confidence we have uh, right now in our tests is much higher than any time in the past. Due to this confidence, stability, 
and performance and not be constantly frustrated with slow and flaky tests, our developers started to write more and better tests again. Not only unit tests, but also UI tests and integration tests. Those UI tests would now not test the whole application like in the past, but the UI of one specific module. As an example, we can have UI tests which test just the UI of the home appliance control module without the burden to start the complete application. And because they were just for one module, they are easier to write and maintain than normal UI tests on the whole application. Another step in our testing strategy was to add tests which would test multiple units. And in our case, to test a complete module from start to finish. And not, not just one single class or function. The so-called integration tests. Before we dive into them, some words about how we, do, how we handle our dependencies in our unit tests. If we want to unit test a class, we are injecting all their dependencies as mocks. Then we are able to stop this mocks and test all scenarios needed. In my example here, I have a get information class, and in order for that class to work, it needs an information source interface. In the unit test, we are initializing this class using an information source mock, which we then can fully control and modify. We stop that mock with all the necessary information and then check if our class is working as expected. Unit tests do a very good job, actually an excellent job, of assuring that one specific class or a function is working correctly. Unfortunately, a feature does not consist of just one class, but a combination of multiple classes and functions. Even one simple functionality can involve dozens of different classes. As an example, to, to start an, a program in one of our appliances, we need to check the appliance status and probably write some logs. And if the appliance is powered off, then we need to power the appliance on. And in order to do so, we need to send a command to the appliance. And if the command was successful, then we could set the correct options to the appliance in order to finally, finally start it. We need to check that all the above things cooperated correctly and that the start appliance procedure is, uh, is finishing successfully and it's working as expected. Um, again, our modularization helped us here. A few details on how, how each of our modules is structured. Each of our modules has a nice and clean public API and has the implementation part. Usually the most part of the implementation is private to this module and just the parts which need to be public are public. Each module has its own documentation each module has its own tests, each module has its own mocks there. And each module defines its external dependencies in order to work correctly. This feature module would, in order to work correctly, need a logger, some persistence functionality like a database, and home appliance logic from another module. So, we inject those dependencies into this module exactly like we are injecting dependencies into a class. Now, in our integration tests, we mock those external dependencies here. And therefore, we can control them completely. And then we can test the input and the output of the complete feature module. And we, we are able to test if complete workflows are executed correctly. But we wanted to extract even more confidence out of our automated test process. 
But if you remember in the past, we had some quite bad experience with end-to-end -end tests. And we we really hesitate in doing that again. So we opt that we don't actually want end-to-end -end tests over the whole application. But what we are doing is module to end tests. Using our small and flexible modules, we are able to have tests against real services. If we want to check that our asset module is fetching the, some entities from external REST service correctly, and if the response is also the response we are awaiting, how do we do that? In order to, to call the external REST service, our application or our user needs to be authenticated. But the authentication is actually an external dependency of our asset module. So we inject that dependency, we authenticate the user in our test automatically, and we then we are calling the external REST service authenticated, and we can check if it responds correctly. That way, we can be sure that our module always works end-to-end -end correctly. So, what did we learn over all these years? Divide and conquer. Do not try to test your whole monolith at once. Split it up. Invest time to have a clean and manageable structure and test each part thoroughly. If you see that your application, that the software becomes a monolith, take the time and modularize it. Modularization will save you a lot of trouble. It will, will make your project flexible again and it will greatly increase your build process. Random failing tests, they are not so random. There are always a, a reason behind them. Take care of them immediately because they will not magically and somehow disappear. Tests on multiple levels have a lot, a lot of UI tests, uh, sorry, unit tests. Have integration tests, have end-to-end -end tests, have UI tests. And if um, you have some scenarios which cannot be tested automatically, then have manual tests. And try to have an automated process which gives you the confidence that your product and your releases work without issues. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'll probably be awaiting your, your questions. And uh, you can reach me anytime, either through LinkedIn or Twitter, or I'll be at our booth outside, Duxman, and we can talk about automated testing all day long. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I, I okay, can. so we have time for questions. So anyone up for a question? Raise your hand and talk really loud. Questions? Here, we've got one. Hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. I curious to know uh, how, the, how do your automated testers feel now after all this implemented uh, huge work how much is it better they are, they are much better like I said also we have now confidence that if um, some of our tests is read that something really broke and we are able to fix it automatically um, of course there is always room for improvement so we have a very very good layer of uh, unit tests and integration tests but now we are uh, want to do is actually have more module to end tests right now but it's fast and um, we have a, a very good confidence in our tests a high confidence in our tests D did you answer your question yes i was hoping for some numbers maybe uh, mostly yes thank you but maybe you have some numbers about successfulness of your test runs oh um Right now, we are, I think, so 5% of our tests are failing, of our test runs, 
are failing due to flakiness because else everything else is stable. So we have flaky tests from time to time and we try to fix them uh, immediately, really. So right now ex we're expecting at our development branch we have around about 5% of failed builds. Okay, awesome. We have another question over here. You're not make, making me run a lot, that's good. <laughs> so I have a question. <clears throat> So, from what you told us, there have been some stages where you had to do some big investments. So, like, uh, probably the, this has uh, impacted, like, feature development. And uh, my question is, uh, this situation arises frequently. So, as developers, we are in the situation that we have to, we know that we have to make a big investment and we have to convince other people that this investment makes sense. So, do you have any tips for us when we get into this situation? Because it appears in your case it was successful, so I, I thank know, you. I know, I know exactly what you mean, really exactly what you mean, and it's, well, it, it, it is very hard to convince the stakeholders that you are needing that. So in our case, we had the luck that we were at the bottom. So they saw that and they, needed, they said, okay, we need to do something, we are not able to release anymore, we are blocked. And there we got the budget, so we were lucky there. But you need to talk with the stakeholders, convince them, and do not um, a tip there. Do not tell them that, okay, that needs three months. No, no, no. It, you will never get the budget for three months. It's impossible. Always do small steps. So have a new feature, have it done in clean architecture. So rewrite, refactor small parts. And over the time, you will see your code base will become better and you will moving slowly to the new architecture. We also, right now, we have parts of our application still in MVVM. So parts which are working fine and we do not have changes there. We didn't change that. So we are fixing, refactoring the parts which are more troublesome and we are slowly evolving to this clean architecture. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. So don't overpromise, overdeliver. <laughs> uh, don't estimate too much. Because if you said to the stakeholders, uh, we need six months to do a complete refactor, and then you're actually telling them we need six months to refactor, and then at the end we will have exactly the same product. Okay. Uh, from a from a business perspective, 